oftentimes when people talk about polygamy, they just talk about, well, should it be decriminalized? And I think certainly it could be decriminalized, so we will no longer put people in jail for trying to marry more than one person. But I really think that that is not enough because people are also really right, their intuitions are correct, that polygamy does give rise, I think, to some fairly exploitative and opportunistic behavior that's really not what we aspire to for family law and family relations in the United States. It's taken us a really long time to get to where we are now, where marriage is at least formally egalitarian for men and for women, for husbands and for wives, and that's really, really important. So my thought is that current family law, it's what I call dyadic, right? It's really meant for two, and it does that pretty well. Um, but I think that we could also accommodate polygamy, probably not through current family law, but actually through a whole other part of the law that people don't usually associate with family law, but what lawyers think about all the time, which is commercial partnership law. And if you think about it, what's really causing a lot of the opportunities for bad behavior in polygamy is it's the serial ongoing nature of, of, the, of the union, that people come and people go. And this is kind of what creates a lot of opportunities for vulnerability and for people to take advantage of each other. Well, as lawyers know, that's also what characterizes the commercial partnership form as well, is that people come and people go. You think about a law firm. You and I start a law firm, right? And then after a few years, we're doing well, we admit someone else. And then I want to go do something else, so I leave. And then you admit a few more partners, and then one of them leaves to pursue something else. So it's that ongoing multiplicity with people coming and people going that actually gives rise to the opportunities for vulnerability. And my point is we already have an entire set of laws and norms, what we call in law default rules, that we can turn to that are trying to address this issue and trying to get people to treat each other more fairly as a baseline. Now, I'm not saying, okay, we're just going to make polygamy just like commercial partnership. Of course not. What I'm saying is that some of the basic norms of commercial partnership law could actually be imported into family law and could be used to govern polygamous unions or what I call plural marital associations. Some of these basic norms would be things like unanimity, that no one can enter a plural marital union unless everyone who's already in the union agrees to it. And that's a very, very big change. So the husband cannot go off on his own unilaterally and just say, hey, look, I brought home a new wife. Instead, all of the current existing wives would have to agree. By the same token, though, anyone could leave for any reason whenever they wanted. So there would be a unilateral right of exit, which is what we already have in dyadic marriage. Another norm that I think is really important would be um, what I call the anti-conversion norm, that people have to decide up front. When you go down to the county clerk's office or when you walk down the aisle, when you sign that piece of paper, you have to pick. Do I want to be in a polygamous union, a plural marital union, or do I want to go the dyadic route? And here's what's really important about that. People have to pick, even if there's only two of them, who say, gee, one day we might want to admit some more wives or some more husbands, they still would have to pick at that precise moment. So they'd have to check the plural marital union box, even though there would only be two at the moment. And then you can't convert, you can't cross back and forth. So if you've got, if you've signed up for the dyadic marriage, which is what we have now, and you want to add someone else, you'd have to divorce and you'd have to re-up under the plural marital union. So that would give protection for spouses who really want to be in dyadic unions. The moment that we recognized no-fault divorce, we basically recognized serial polygamy or what some people call polygamy on the installment plan, right? So right now, you know, you can marry as many people as you want, just not all at the same time. And as a lot of divorced people, particularly divorced women will tell you, Having your husband leave you and move on to marry someone else creates its own set of economic vulnerabilities and can really actually create some economic harms for your children and also some emotional harms for your children. Family law has documented that it's not true of all men, but oftentimes when people break up, particularly when they're younger, men remarry and they start a whole new family and that takes time and energy and resources away from the first family or the second family or the third family, depending on how many times people get remarried. And by the same token, we also have de facto polygamy. We have some men who never marry, but they have uh, babies with lots of different women. 
we don't prohibit that. You know, we don't say that that somehow should be criminal and you should have to go to jail. We do insist that they support all of those, all of those children, and we do insist that they support all of those families. But my point is, if we allow people to have lots of different families without being married, and if we allow people to divorce and remarry as many times as they want, it seems very odd to me that we would say that someone who's saying, I want to take care of all of these families at the same time, that we would take that person and put him in jail. In researching this article, I discovered that the densest populations of practicing polygamists are not Mormons, not fundamentalist Mormons in rural Utah and rural Colorado and Arizona. It's actually fundamentalist African Americans in urban Philadelphia. And they're actually practicing a really different form of polygamy, or it comes from a very different place. I think in the United States imagination, the American imagination, we think about polygamists as people who are um, rural people, uh, largely uneducated, that's what we imagine them to be, on a compound somewhere in rural America that's governed by a despot who's on the FBI's most wanted list. And we think child brides, and we think young boys who are forced away from their families, what they call lost boys. We think about people who are, um, people who are being horribly, horribly oppressed. And what I want to do in my research is look and see what if we supplement or even displace that image with African Americans who are happily working and living their lives in, in, in urban populations, who are not marrying children, who are, uh, who are not oppressing other people, who where the women actually have a fair amount of bargaining power because they're working outside the home, and no one frankly even knows that they're polygamous because there's really no abuse happening. What happens if we kind of shift our lens a little bit to think about that image in addition to this other image that we think we rightfully find so troubling?